Well, good morning and, uh, and welcome to the uh, Energy and National Security event at the CSIS, which this morning will be uh, the, uh, hosting the launch of the Energy Information Administration's uh, International Energy Outlook 2010 with uh, projections to the year 2020, 2035 for the first time. Uh, they'll be extending the outlook uh, an additional five years. So uh, we're very pleased uh, to be able to host uh, the EIA event this morning. Uh, for those I haven't met, I'm Guy Caruso with the Energy and National Security Program here, headed by Frank Verastro. And uh, we've now been uh, lucky enough to host the uh, launching of the International Energy Outlook uh, for about, I guess, about five years five now, years. five years. And we're especially uh, pleased to have Howard Grunspeck, the Deputy Administrator of EIA, here to present the uh, outlook uh, this morning. Um, those of you who have been around the energy community within uh, Washington know Howard very well through his distinguished career as, as a public servant and uh, He's had uh, experience uh, as an academician at Carnegie Mellon after his PhD from Yale and uh, is one of the leading energy and uh, environmental experts uh, around the world. And so I was very uh, lucky to have Howard as my deputy for uh, six and a half years at EIA, so it's uh, doubly pleased to to introduce him this morning. Uh, the IEO is one of those benchmark publications, much like the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook and, uh, and those uh, published by uh, private sector as well. It's, it's looked upon as one of those uh, publications that sets, gives you an idea of where trends are headed. It isn't so much the uh, precise numbers, but it's the, the shift in trends that we've observed over the years. I was just looking today at the outlook and uh, seeing that oil now is projected to be about 30% of the world's energy in 2035. When I first presented the IEO seven or eight years ago, that was close to 40%. So there has been a dramatic change in the trends, in, in the big picture for energy, uh, fuel-wise and uh, geopolitically, where those, uh, where demand and supply are coming from. And those are the kinds of things that we really look for in the, the IEO and the kinds of insights that someone with Howard's uh, experience and perspective brings to us. So you've got the more detail about Howard's background, so I won't uh, belabor that. Just want to once again thank you all for coming, and uh, we really appreciate uh, the quality of the uh, of the types of uh, individuals that come to the, our events here. I just wanted to thank you all for taking the time to be here, and I want to thank Howard and the the EIA team for the continuing excellence that uh, you bring to this this position. So, Howard, thank you for coming. Thank you, Guy. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you for the very uh, kind introduction, Guy, and I'd like to thank both you and Frank for hosting us today. Uh, you know, we really appreciate the opportunity to share our views with such a, a knowledgeable audience. Uh, if we present this in, in DOE headquarters, all we get is short-term questions about uh, what OPEC's going to do next week and, and what's going to happen uh, in the Gulf. Uh, I assume we'll get those questions anyway, but at least we get some other questions. Uh, the International Energy Outlook 2010 is the EIA's latest assessment of world uh, energy markets, and this year, as Guy indicated, we have projections through 2035. Unlike many other long-term outlooks, which usually incorporate at least the expected value of policy changes that can significantly influence energy outcomes, 
The IEO is based on existing laws and regulations. Uh, as is the case with all data and analyses from EIA, the views presented uh, in the outlook are ours alone and do not uh, represent those, necessarily represent those of the Department of Energy or the administration. Uh, before turning to the outlook itself, I want to recognize those who really do the work to put it together. Uh, John Conti directs EIA's long-term modeling office. Uh, Glenn Sweetnam led the division that produces this outlook. Uh, at least he led it until his recent detail to the staff of the National Security Council to help out on energy issues. Uh, Linda Doman, always a critical player, has stepped up to a leadership role in his absence. Uh, I should also mention that, that Richard Newell, EIA's administrator, had planned on making this presentation but could not be here due to his participation in the strategic and economic dialogue uh, between the U.S. and China in, that's just wrapping up in Beijing. So he's, uh, I think he's on his way back. He'll be back on Thursday, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't here. So uh, you'll have a real treat when you see him uh, next year. So without further ado, uh, the uh, IEO 2010 reference case reflects a scenario in which current laws and policies remain unchanged throughout the projection period. Uh, just a little context for getting started. The, the global recession that began at the end of 2007 and continued into 2009 has had a profound impact on world energy use. Total mar marketed energy consumption contracted uh, by 1.2% in 2008, by another 2.2% uh, in 2009, as uh, manufacturing and industrial energy use was particularly hard hit. Uh, in the reference case, however, as the economic situation improves, most nations return to the economic growth patterns that were anticipated before the recession began, and we expect total world energy uh, consumption to increase by nearly 50% to 2035. Uh, as you can see from the chart, the most rapid growth occurs in nations outside the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which I'll just refer to as non-OECD uh, in this talk. Total non-OECD energy consumption increases by 84% uh, in the reference case. In contrast, within the OECD, uh, energy use increases by only 14% uh, over this period of time. Uh, Guy already mentioned this. This is sort of the, the, the sort of the big picture view of, of where our energy comes from or where we think it may be coming from. And the composition of global energy use as well as its level is expected to change over time. Uh, with higher and rising world oil prices through most of the projection period, the share of liquid fuels in total energy use falls from 35% in 2007 to a projected 30% uh, in 2035. And I should point out that that 30% includes biofuels. If you knock biofuels out, uh, probably another little 1% to 2% of that 30% is biofuels. Uh, renewables are the fastest growing source of world energy. Uh, over the 2007 to 2035 period, but they start from a relatively low base. Uh, their projected share rises to 14% in 2035, or 16% if liquid biofuels are included. Uh, the protected market share of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power uh, are relatively uh, stable uh, over this outlook. Uh, but overall, despite the growth in renewable energy use, Fossil fuels are still projected to provide uh, about 79% of marketed energy in 2035. So at least uh, in the current laws and policies world, uh, we would expect uh, fossil fuels to continue to be very uh, important. Uh, those of you who do global climate change uh, modeling and long-term energy modeling know a lot about the Kaya, what's called the Kaya identity. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a figure that shows really the roles of economic growth, population growth, and uh, energy intensity improvement in the different regions of the world. 
Uh, certainly, economic growth is a key driver of energy projections. And in our outlook, world economic output increases at an average annual 3.2 percent from 2007 through 2035. As shown by the, I guess I have to check colors, as uh, shown by the green bars, uh, it's pretty clear that economic output grows faster in the developing world than in the mature industrial economies. Uh, outside the OECD, the economic growth averages 4.4 percent per year over the projection, while the growth rate in the OECD is 2 percent per year. So uh, it's a, sort of a good news story uh, in terms of well-being. If you look at countries like China and India, their, their economic growth is uh, significantly exceeding their population growth rates, so that per capita income is growing. But this has some significant implications for international energy markets over the next several decades as per capita income grows. Uh, expected improvements in energy intensity shown by the gold bars, which fortunately all point downward, uh, moderate the effect of economic growth on projected growth in energy use. Like everyone else, uh, EIA is paying considerable attention to world oil markets. Uh, recent experience demonstrates that oil prices uh, can uh, be quite volatile. Uh, we're all familiar with the increase in prices uh, from 2003 to mid-July 2008 when prices collapsed. Uh, in 2009, oil prices trended upward throughout the year from about $42 a barrel in January to $74 per barrel in December. Uh, prices generally have been moving up through the first four months of this year, uh, but a fairly sharp move down over the last three weeks. Uh, EIA's short-term energy outlook, which we update each month, contains our forecasts of energy markets over the next 12 to 24 months. The international energy outlook that we are discussing today should not be used uh, for this purpose. Even over the long term, however, oil prices can vary over a very broad range uh, as they are substantially influenced by both economic and non-economic above-the-ground issues as well as by geology. Recognizing the uncertainty in long-term oil prices, uh, our outlook provides three cases that span a very broad range of potential prices, and even those cases do not encompass all the possibilities. But I'll focus mostly on our reference case, uh, and as the world economies recover, the reference case does reflect a return to higher oil prices with the price of U.S. light sweet crude, which is what we uh, use as our benchmark uh, for uh, these graphs, increasing to $95 per barrel in 2015, and that's in real terms, $2,008, and $133 a barrel in 2035. The relationship between the growth in global liquids demand and the growth in non-OPEC liquid supply is an important touchstone of the IEO oil price cases. Reference case prices continue to rise as world economies recover and global demand once again grows more rapidly than non-OPEC liquid supply. So the call on OPEC is increasing. By 2035, global liquids use, including biofuels, is about 111 million barrels a day, roughly 60 percent of which is produced outside of OPEC. Our petroleum liquids projections continue to run somewhat below those in the International Energy Agency's recent World Energy Outlook 2009. Uh, that only goes out to 2030, so we can't discuss uh, 2035, but in 2030, our reference case is about 5 million barrels per day less petroleum in 2030 uh, than the WIO. Uh, but again, these different price trajectories are very different futures. So in the low price trajectory, where oil remains at $51 a barrel through 2035, projected non-biofuels liquids demand is 120 million barrels per day in 2035, while under the high oil price case, in which oil prices rise steadily to over $200 per barrel in 2035, 
non-biofuels liquids demand in 2035 is about 90 million barrels per day. So that's, you know, it's more than today's oil demand, but not by much. So again, there's certainly a wide range of possibilities. So where does uh, the oil come from in this outlook? To meet the increase in world demand in the reference case, liquids production increases by a total of 25.8 million barrels per day from 2007 to 2035. The reference case uh, assumes that OPEC, OPEC countries invest in incremental production capacity in order to maintain approximately a 40 percent share of total world's liquids production through 2035. And that's really consistent with their share over the past 15 years. So there have been a lot of certainly changes and developments in oil markets, but if you look at the OPEC share of total liquids, it, it has been, for one reason or another, about 40 percent over the past 15 years. Uh, increasing volumes of conventional liquids, that's crude oil, lease condensate, natural gas, plant liquids, and refinery gain uh, from OPEC contribute 11.5 million barrels a day to the total increase in world liquids production, and conventional supplies from non-OPEC countries add another 4.8 million barrels per day. Now, I, I think a, you know, an important part of this is, is how do we get up to the 25.8, and the answer is unconventional resources, and in that group we include oil sands, extra heavy oil, biofuels, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, and at the end, even a little bit of shale oil from both OPEC and non-OPEC sources grow by an average of 4.9 percent a year over the projection period. And uh, world production of unconventional liquid fuels increases by 9.5 million barrels a day. And uh, by the end, by 2035, they account for 13 percent of uh, production. So they're definitely uh, a significant part uh, of the picture, not a major part, but a major part of the increment between where we are today and where we're going uh, in this uh, reference case. Uh, when I think of uh, the National Security and Energy Program at uh, CSIS, I do think of oil, so I'm going to drill a little more deeply into oil, then talk a little bit about natural gas, which is of great interest, a tiny bit about coal. So uh, that's the agenda, if you wonder where I'm taking you. So. Looking deeper into oil, I'm now drilling into the uh, OPEC production of conventional liquids. And we see virtually all of the increase in OPEC conventional production occurs in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, really three countries uh, have the story here, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait. Uh, Saudi Arabia remains the largest liquids producer in OPEC with conventional production increasing to 15.1 million barrels per day in the reference case. And keep in mind, this is all production, not just crude. So the natural gas plant liquids are included and the lease condensate are included in this. Uh, Iraq is projected to increase its liquids production at an average rate of almost 4 percent a year in the reference case, which is the highest annual growth rate among all OPEC producers. Uh, Iraq's conventional production increases from uh, 2.1 million barrels per day in 2007 to 3.1 million barrels per day in 2020 and then to 6.1 million barrels per day in 2035. Now, uh, were OPEC to raise its production more quickly uh, as it discusses, and, and that's certainly a possibility uh, in this kind of setup, it's likely that uh, Saudi Arabia would be the the one to uh, reduce its production. So again, these are just an example of how things uh, could be uh, put together. Uh, Iran and Venezuela are two OPEC countries that are not projected to see uh, the major increase uh, in production. Moving outside of OPEC, but staying uh, in the conventional side, uh, I guess this, uh, this one is set up with uh, areas with expected conventional oil production growth on the left and those with expected declines uh, more to the right. So you can see that uh, we do see 
uh, a growth in conventional OPEC, sorry, conventional non-OPEC oil production, despite the fact that there's maturity of many uh, of these non-OPEC producing basins. And the uh, increases are led by uh, production gains in Brazil, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, and the United States. I should note that the U.S. projections, which were developed before the recent oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, include expanded production of oil on the federal outer continental shelf. Uh, so that is definitely a part of this projection. And as you know, currently, the federal outer continental shelf in the Gulf of Mexico provides about 30 percent of U.S. crude oil production. Uh, among non-OPEC producers, the lack of many prospects for new large conventional petroleum liquids projects and declines in production from existing conventional fields result in heavy investment in the development of smaller fields. Producers are expected to concentrate their efforts on more efficient exploration of fields that are already in production, either through the use of more advanced technology for primary recovery efforts or through enhanced oil recovery techniques. And there's uh, a lot of potential in enhanced oil recovery techniques. So moving from the conventional to the unconventional, uh, you know, these resources, oil sands, extra heavy oil, biofuels, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, and shale oil from both OPEC and non-OPEC sources do become increasingly competitive in the reference case. And again, uh, world production grows quite significantly. Uh, oil sands from Canada and biofuels, and the biofuels are largely from the United States and Brazil, are the largest components of future unconventional production in the uh, International Energy Outlook reference case, providing a combined 70 percent of the incremental unconventional supply over the projection period. So again, uh, the extra heavy oil, which is pretty much tied to what goes on in Venezuela, uh, coal to liquids, gas to liquids, and shale oil are relatively smaller uh, contributors. Now again, to, to illustrate uh, the effect of these oil price cases, I should note that the three cases that we look at each reflect alternative assumptions about the sources and costs of world supplies. So prices are not the only factor that differ across these cases. So in the high oil price case, key non-OPEC countries, including Russia, Brazil, and Kazakhstan, further restrict access to or increase taxes on production from prospective areas. And OPEC member countries, including Saudi Arabia and Iraq, restrain increases to production substantially compared to the reference case. So this leads to oil prices uh, substantially in excess of the reference case path, and that dampens demand for liquid fuels, because even if in the short run the response to higher prices is relatively small, over time higher prices do make a difference to demand. Uh, higher prices also enable increased production from both high-cost conventional and from unconventional non-OPEC resources that are still accessible and attractive for exploration and development. So in the high cost case, demand for liquids other than biofuels is about 90 million barrels per day in 2035, about 17 million barrels per day less than in the reference case projection. So again, I think it's important to keep these, these other cases in mind, not overly focus on the reference case. I'm not going to discuss uh, the different economic growth cases that will be provided in the full outlook, those also have a tremendous impact on energy demand. Again, sometimes, uh, you know, we are very concerned about energy demand and its relationship to prices. It is critical to recognize that economic growth and energy demand are intimately related, and I think we've all seen that over the last several years. So maybe I don't have to emphasize that as much as I uh, might have in the past. Moving to natural gas, we see projected uses increasing by nearly 50 percent, led by growth in OECD, Asia, the Middle East, and North America. 
again, with the world oil prices that we have in our reference case uh, and prices remaining high throughout the end of the projection period, consumers opt for comparatively less expensive natural gas for their energy needs whenever possible. Uh, in addition, because natural gas produces less carbon dioxide when it's burned than does either coal or petroleum, governments implementing national or regional plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, may encourage its use to replace other fossil fuels, particularly in electric power generation and in the industrial sector, where, for example, newly constructed petrochemical plants are expected to rely increasingly on natural gas as a feedstock. So that's the demand picture for natural gas. What about supply? Uh, most of the increase in natural gas production is expected to come from the non-OECD countries, which account for about 89 percent of the total increase in world supply to 2035. Major increments come from the Middle East, non-OECD, Asia, Africa, and Russia, and the other countries of non-OECD Europe and Eurasia. Natural gas production from the OECD increases by 5 trillion cubic feet from 2007 to 2035, and the largest increase among these nations is projected for the United States. Shale gas is a key contributor to the growth in U.S. production. So this graph really looks at the unconventional gas picture and where it makes a huge difference and it's clear that the extent of the world's tight gas, shale gas, and coal bed methane resources has not yet been fully assessed. But based on what we do know, we are projecting a substantial increase in these supplies. In the United States, which we do know best, rising estimates for shale gas resources have helped increase total proved natural gas reserves by almost 50 percent over the past decade and shale gas rises from about 6 percent of total U.S. natural gas production in 2007, uh, it was 13 percent in 2009, so it really has risen fast, to 26 percent in 2035 in the reference case. If you look at all the unconventionals together, tight gas, shale gas, and coal, ga coal bed methane, these resources are also very important for the future of natural gas supplies in Canada and China where they're projected to account for 63 and 56 percent of total production, respectively, in 2035. And you can see that in the United States, uh, it also accounts for uh, in the 60 percent range of total production in 2035 in this projection. So again, unconventional gas, uh, critically uh, important. Turning to coal, uh, as noted at the beginning, we do see uh, a significant rise uh, in absolute coal use uh, over the projection, with the share of coal use remaining flat. Uh, however, in contrast to the projected rise in natural gas use, which occurs in nearly all parts of the world, the nations of non-OECD Asia, especially China and India, account for 95 percent of the total net increase in coal use over the projection period. Increasing demand for energy to fuel electricity generation and industrial production in this region is met uh, significantly with the use of coal. So in this region, uh, in the U.S., coal is used almost exclusively for electricity generation. Uh, in China, coal is used for both electricity generation and in industry. In fact, I believe there may be more uh, use of coal in industry than in electricity generation. Installed coal fire generating capacity in China more than doubles uh, from 2007 to 2035, and coal use in the industrial sector grows by 55 percent. So again, a substantial increase in the use of coal. Looking at electricity, uh, again, we expect generation to increase rapidly. Uh, total net generation in the non-OECD countries increases by 3.3 percent per year on average as compared with 1.1 percent per year in the OECD uh, nations. From 2007 to 2035, the renewable share 
of total electricity generation increases from 18 percent to 23 percent. Hydro and wind supply much of the growth in renewable energy consumption over the projection period. Uh, nuclear power generation is attracting new interest as countries seek to increase the diversity of their energy supplies, improve energy security, and provide a low carbon alternative to fossil fuels. While nuclear power projections are highly uncertain, uh, we do incorporate improved prospects for world nuclear power, and the projection for nuclear generation is 9 percent higher than the projection uh, published in last year's outlook. Uh, well, some of the largest increases occur in China. There are some increases in Europe as well, where there has been some policy change uh, over the past year uh, in Belgium, in Italy. Uh, I think Sweden has passed uh, some uh, laws that envision nuclear power continuing for some time, and I believe the German government will reconsider uh, their position on, on nuclear power. So looking at transportation, uh, some of these sort of in integrated sectors uh, from the demand side, the transportation share of world liquid fuel use increases uh, over the projection. Uh, again, in the, in the non, uh, or, or in the OECD, in fact, uh, transportation energy use fell dramatically over the past few years, but outside the OECD, transportation use for energy increased in 2007 and in 2008, and even in 2009, it grew by an estimated 3.2 uh, percent, uh, despite the, the slowdown in the economy. This in part reflects some of the subsidies uh, that are provided. Uh, with robust uh, economic growth expected to continue in China and India and other non-OECD nations, uh, we think there's growing demand for business and personal travel and we expect non-OECD transportation energy use to more than double from, 20, from 2007 to 2035. Uh, OECD energy transportation, energy use for transportation is a different story. Uh, in fact, it declined uh, in the past two years, and in the reference case, it doesn't even regain its 2007 level until 2020 and grows only slightly uh, thereafter. So again, a very different picture in terms of transportation. I think in transportation we often think mostly about uh, personal vehicle transportation, which we talk about a lot uh, as a matter of policy in this uh, country. Uh, in 2007, about two-thirds of transportation energy use in the OECD countries was for passenger travel. Uh, for the non-OECD countries, passenger travel accounted for 56 percent of total transportation energy use in 2007. So again, the, the share of freight was higher. Uh, we do see freight uh, transportation energy growing faster than personal transportation energy, in part because projected efficiency gains are much more robust for light-duty passenger vehicles than for freight uh, modes of transport. Uh, we have not reflected the, uh, the President's uh, announcement about his plans for heavy trucks uh, in this uh, projection. And many of the potential freight-related transport efficiencies have already been realized uh, in the existing fleet because some of the barriers uh, to adoption of uh, cost-effective energy efficiency uh, in the private sector, uh, sorry, in the, in the personal transportation market don't apply to the freight transportation market. So both passenger and freight travel increase over the projection period, but worldwide energy consumption for freight travel increases at about twice the rate of energy use for passenger transportation. So the last uh, slide is the bottom line on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this reference case does not include specific policies to limit greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and energy-related carbon dioxide emissions uh, are projected to rise from uh, uh, under 30 billion metric tons in 2007 uh, to about 42 uh, billion metric tons in 2035, an increase of 43 percent. 
Again, strong economic growth, continued heavy reliance on fossil fuels, uh, much of the increase in carbon dioxide emissions occurs among developing nations of the world, especially in Asia. Uh, again, China and the U.S. had very similar emissions of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions in 2007, about 6 billion metric tons. In 2035, uh, built into this projection, uh, U.S. emissions are 6.3 billion metric tons, so relatively small growth, while China's emissions are projected at 13.3 billion metric tons. So with that, uh, these are mostly just a repeat of some of the key uh, trends. So uh, I appreciate your attention. I would welcome your questions. I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Howard, for a very clear and uh, precise exposition of the uh, latest outlook by the uh, Energy Information Administration. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor to questions because I know there are so many good uh, uh, questions that we're, we're here. But while while I'm uh, calling on them, what, there's one uh, thing that jumped out at me uh, on the demand side, and that is, uh, you know, relatively strong improvement in the energy intensity or energy relationship between GDP and, and the emerging economies is. What's the uh, driving, what, what's your primary assumptions re with respect to the uh, relationship between GDP and other economic activity and energy use in, in places like China and India? Well, we do see uh, significant uh, improvements in uh, energy intensity. Uh, you know, one of the things is that improvements in energy intensity are linked to uh, often linked to the, to the uh, building of new capital equipment and the, uh, generally the uh, developing countries are, are adding a lot of, of new capital equipment, uh, much more so than the uh, mature uh, economies. I think we can see that in lots of places. We see that in the industrial sector. We see that in the electric power sector. Uh, we do see uh, as the economies grow there will be some shift in the composition of the economies as well. Structural change also matters. So uh, the growing role of services in those economies should help uh, with their energy intensity as well. But we do expect uh, industry to remain important in those economies as they develop, although its share of the total as the growth occurs will decline. So it's a combination of uh, reductions in intensity, uh, due to, uh, you know, the, the, the rel relative modernity of the capital stock plus some composition shift toward services. Thank you. Secretary Schlesinger, is there a, yes, it's on. A couple of questions. First, <clears throat> we see the growth of demand in the, within the OPEC countries, domestic demand. And some of the projections show uh, internal demand in Saudi Arabia rising to eight or nine million barrels a day, as opposed to your top projection of 15 million barrels. And uh, similarly with some of the other Gulf countries. The consequence would be less oil uh, relatively speaking, for the international market. Have, have you factored that into your projections? And if so, what does the, is the implication? Secondly, uh, the Iraqis uh, keep insisting that they're going to be uh, producing about 16 million barrels a day. Uh, your projection is 6 million for the year 2035, which means that you put a very high rate of discount on Iraqi projections of their growth. Would you comment on that? 
Well, maybe the right answer is to link the two questions and say that if the Saudis consume more of their production, that the Iraqis will uh, produce more to export to us. But, but, but not linking them, uh, you know, we, we do uh, reflect both the demand and supply from the, from the Middle East. Uh, we do think that uh, there will be an interest in, uh, given the relative price of petroleum and natural gas, that there, there will be an interest in substituting uh, some natural gas for the, grow, you know, for the growth in energy consumption uh, in the Middle East region, which does, I think, tend to free up some uh, oil for the world market, despite the growth in demand uh, for uh, oil and natural gas uh, in the Middle East. Uh, again, with respect to the uh, Iraqis, it, it is early days uh, to know how the sort of the, the aspirations and the plans will relate to the uh, reality. Uh, you know, there are several ways of looking at this. One, uh, uh, EIA is often accused of being very optimistic about the potential for uh, conventional oil resources. So uh, it, it's, a, it's maybe a little refreshing uh, to be accused of being too pessimistic. Uh, but, but another, you know, uh, certainly other, other possibilities include a, a world with a lot more oil supply looks a lot more like our low uh, oil price case world. I mean, if, if, if Iraq is really going to produce at, at those levels, and, and if demand is, is going to be consistent, you know, with the kind of track that we've laid out here, then, then some, something got to give. I mean, either demand has to be a lot higher, and there are people who believe that. Uh, you know, someone like, like a Dermot Gately, uh, you know, has, has made the argument that these projections for demand uh, for both EIA and the IEA are much too low. Uh, so there could be higher demand, uh, or there could be lower prices leading to higher demand. So there are a lot of different ways that the puzzle uh, could be put together. And in our outlook, we try to, you know, talk about the reference case, but we do recognize that there are other, other ways that the puzzle could be put together. But higher Iraqi production is certainly one possibility. Joe Duker. Uh. Howard, in the current version of NEMS, how are natural gas prices projected? Uh, specifically, how closely uh, in the 2010 outlook uh, do they track world oil price? Uh, and to what extent does the model reflect uh, the divergence between oil prices and natural gas prices that we've actually seen? Well, we do have uh, a divergence between oil and natural gas prices in North America in, in NEMS. I should point out that when we look at energy markets, I, you know, oil is clearly the globally traded, globally priced commodity. Uh, natural gas is certainly globally traded to some extent, but transportation is a much bigger piece, if you will, of the price of natural gas, you know, liquefaction and, 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 and transporting LNG. So the world gas market is not nearly as integrated as the world oil market. And we definitely think that natural gas prices can differ regionally across the world in significant ways, whereas we, we generally view oil as having a single price, at least before subsidies and taxes uh, around the world. So in North America, in NEMS, uh, we have on an energy equivalent basis, we have the price of oil about three times higher than the price of natural gas on a, on a BTU equivalent basis throughout the projection in North America. So the price of oil rises, the price of gas rises at a much slower rate, in part because of the shale gas resource in North America and the strong resource base we have here. And we do expect uh, oil and natural gas prices in North America to diverge significantly. Uh, and that can happen in North America even if it's not happening as much in the rest of the world. Couldn't it happen in Europe also? 
it could happen in Europe also. There's clearly a lot of pressure on the oil linked pricing of natural gas. And there's a question as to what extent, you know, that, that system of oil linked contracts uh, can remain uh, intact. You know, it is giving around the edges already, as you know. Yes, sir. Would you please identify uh, yourself, please? Andy Patterson with EBI. Howard, can you talk about what happens to, let's say, nuclear and coal uh, power project plants when the tax credits fall off? EIA has traditionally taken the view that we don't get to nth plant. Market doesn't provide enough incentive once you get past the 6,000 megawatts that have the tax credits. The market doesn't just stimulate more production, more purchases of those kinds of plants. Um, how do you defend that view when Congress wants to get off of the tax incentives and, and push things to the nth plant if it's not really happening? What, what are in your assumptions? Well, uh, I, think that I think a big question about nuclear power, certainly in the U.S. context, is, is what are the costs of the, of the plant? I mean, we have, you know, been in a, in a mode recently where uh, estimates of the cost of these plants has been rising. Uh, certainly the, the assumptions we use in our modeling, those plants have been getting more expensive. We have been building uh, some plants beyond the, the, the six uh, gigawatts that get the production tax credits. Uh, we have projected that in our loan guarantees. Uh, sorry, we have projected uh, that. Uh, Congress is looking at loan guarantees. Uh, Congress is obviously looking at some of these issues in the context of the Kerry Lieberman proposal, which would change permanently the tax treatment of nuclear. So uh, there's a role of a price on carbon itself, which we don't address uh, in this framework. But we do see increasing interest, uh, you know, in nuclear power, uh, both in the U.S. and in other and in Europe, and certainly in developing Asia. And we do reflect that in this outlook. Is it the same logic for coal and CCS? A uh, coal with CCS, we don't have uh, really any significant coal with CCS being built in this outlook under current laws and policies. Uh, we have, I think, a small number of, of, of uh, plants that are demonstration plants that are directly funded. But in terms of economic building of coal with CCS, absent climate policy, uh, it's not in this outlook. We do have some industrial CCS. Okay. Uh, Frank? All right, thanks very much. This is a great presentation. I guess my question goes to, so in the reference case, sorry, thanks. <laughs> this is our own rules and I, I want them. Um, in the reference case, you talk about how 2035, no change in policy. You're still looking at roughly 80% fossil fuels. If you were to run um, this case with the, the administration's proposal for 80% greenhouse gas reductions by 2050, right, how different would it look and is the, the closest approximation the work that you've done on or would it be a good approximation to use the waxman markey analysis? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 obviously the, the, the key issue is reductions in the world. So in, in this context, what happens in the rest of the world is also important. But in, in terms of uh, cases with less greenhouse gas emissions, we do, uh, in, in our domestic analysis, and I think this would apply globally as well, we do think the electric sector is probably the place where uh, the bulk of the early uh, emission reductions uh, in associated with energy would occur. Uh, transportation seems like a, a tougher nut to crack at the present time, although there are certainly a lot of interest in, in alternative uh, paths for transportation. I think a key thing we found in our domestic uh, analysis uh, was the availability of offsets, international offsets, played a key role in, in what we actually did uh, domestically to meet the, the Waxman Markey. Uh, and then finally, the sort of the, I guess, going back to the question about a nuclear and, and, and coal with CCS, I mean, th those are really big question marks. 
And, and we did look at, at some cases where, for one reason or, an, or another, those technologies weren't available, uh, whether due to public acceptance concerns or technology development concerns or, you know, much higher cost than anticipated. And, and you know, it's a much tougher world uh, in those cases. Y you do see a lot more uh, natural gas coming in in those cases, and you do see significantly higher carbon prices in those cases. So, uh, but we still see electricity first in those cases. It does seem that that sector, that's the sector where you have existing demonstrated technologies that are much less carbon intensive, uh, that are already in use, that don't have the sort of, uh, have to make a change in the energy using technology as well as the energy supply technology. So for a whole host of reasons, uh, electricity does seem to be where, if there's flexibility in where you can take the emission reductions, that's where you take them. On, this, Jim? on that question, uh, with a 50% projection of the rise of greenhouse gases, uh, did you make any projections with regard to temperature? Uh, or is that outside of the bailiwick? Of That's the outside. <laughs> well, as, as everyone knows, the, uh, well, not as everyone, uh, as you certainly know, uh, the, the, the energy use and emissions projections are uncertain in and of themselves. And then the relationship of uh, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions concentrations uh, to uh, temperature change uh, are also uh, uncertain. So I don't think it's, it's easy to tie what uh, you, you can calculate pretty easily the impact of this scenario for atmospheric concentration, but tying the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases directly back to a temperature level, I, I think, is quite difficult. Okay, my answer is <laughs> we did not do that. Uh, yes, sir. Um, hi, my name's Simon Lomax. I'm with Bloomberg News. I'm probably going to ask you uh, one of the questions that uh, you were referring to earlier. Um, <laughs> crude oil is off about 20 per cent this month, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how that would affect, firstly, your um, next short-term energy outlook, and then how that would influence a, a longer-term energy outlook like the one you've just rolled out. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure it would have a significant influence uh, on the on the longer term uh, energy outlook. Uh, you know, in ter in terms of the the short term, uh, again, when we we look a lot at, at at obviously the current situation, we look at the uh, you know the the amount of oil in storage, we look at uh, uh, floating. Uh, stocks of oil which which are going up uh, it's also the case though that there there you know there there doesn't appear to be any consensus within OPEC to, to reduce uh, their production targets uh, at the present time uh, again uh, you know current prices are pretty similar to the prices uh, that we had uh, uh, in December uh, they're a little bit lower than the prices that we have now uh, you know, I, I, we're certainly going to look at it, but I don't, I don't think it's a radical change. If you asked us for our projection of summer gasoline prices uh, next month, I know it'll be lower than, than what we published, uh, you know, in the May outlook. Uh, I think we had something like a, like a 2.95 per gallon average summer price in the May outlook uh, with an average oil price of, of 83 uh, dollars per barrel if prices were to drop uh, or to remain where they are now in the low 70s uh, you know you might drop uh, 25 cents a gallon off of that uh, price but I'm not sure we'll, we'll go that far because again the markets are telling us that there's significant short-term uncertainty uh, you know in in oil prices I mean the probability of oil prices exceeding hundred dollars a barrel in September which at the beginning of the month were probably one in five, you know, they're now something like one in 20. But again, there, there is a, you know, prices could go back up again. So I'm not sure that uh, 
will take the full adjustment. Okay. Are there any, uh, yes, uh, in the back. Hi, um, Catherine Ling with Greenwire. I was wondering if uh, you could speak a little bit more about um, how you worked uh, efficiency into um, these projections. You talked a little bit about it with the uh, um, freight, but uh, I, talk, I guess I'm talking about overall energy use. Um, are you just thinking that technology will pretty much stay the same, or, or how are you figuring that? No, we, we, our, our, proje our projections of uh, energy intensity improvement really reflect uh, improvements in efficiency. And we do that in detail. I, I mean, there's a lot more detail in our U.S. projections, but we have uh, more efficient houses, more efficient appliances, more efficient equipment is built in. We look explicitly at the turnover. We look explicitly at standards where they exist. So uh, energy efficiency is, is definitely part of the uh, energy intensity uh, improvement story. Yes. Hi, uh, Will Pearson with Eurasia Group. I feel like it just needs to be brought up, the uh, shale gas outlook, um, the variation in how much you think shale gas and other unconventionals on your high and your reference case versus your high end and low end for unconventionals. How much of a variation do you see both in North America um, with potential environmental regulation and in other countries potential growth in production? How much do you, uh, do you account for that in your outlook? I don't think we really do price sensitivities uh, on natural gas in the same way we do them on oil. Clearly, there's a lot of, uh, as I said, it's still quite early days in the evaluation of the, of the shale gas resource. Uh, it's further along in the United States than in other places. Uh, so a lot remains to be seen. There's certainly a lot of interest in shale in other parts of the world. We do see, we know Canada with the Horn River, you know, that's likely to, to, to go, certainly. China looks like a, a country where, again, a lot of the issue is really demand and supply, not just supply. So in the U.S., you could imagine that there would be even more natural gas production and more shale gas production, but the issue is where, how are you going to use the gas? Un unless you think that you're, uh, uh, that we're, we're going to become a gas exporter or we're going to, uh, li you know, create liquid fuels from the gas, which is very, very, very expensive, uh, then, then the issue is you got to find a way to balance demand and supply for gas. So it comes down to industrial demand for gas and electricity generation demand for gas uh, at a time when electricity demand is not growing that rapidly at a time when we're bringing a lot of renewables into the electricity sector. So I imagine in other, other parts of the world, it's sort of a similar issue. It, it's not just a supply picture, it's a supply and demand picture. And uh, again, I think, I think a lot of the sort of basic resource evaluation that is just going on in the United States now still ha has to go on to a greater extent uh, in other parts of the world. We do, yeah. In our sorry, in our in our uh, U.S. Uh, outlook, uh, John Conti points out that we do look at the implications of not having shale domestic, not having shale gas in the United States, or having uh, a more abundant shale gas resource in the United States, and it makes a huge difference in terms of the price of gas. Uh, and clearly, it has you know knock-on impacts throughout the world because it affects significantly the market for LNG and the like. So th there are sensitivities on shale gas in our domestic outlook, but not in our international outlook. Okay. Andy? Uh, with, with Carrie Lieberman introduced now, we noted that um, when EPA did their analysis of Waxman-Markey, they basically came out with a surprising finding that a lot more energy efficiency tends to push off renewable energy. Uh, would EIA see that interface similarly, that, that a lot of energy efficiency pushes off renewable energy rather than gas and coal? I don't want to comment on, on EPA's uh, 
analysis in detail, but I would point out that our, our building of, of renewables is really driven to a large extent by a combination of, of federal policies, uh, production tax credits. Uh, it's driven by some of the provisions in the stimulus. It's also driven by some of the state level mandates for, for renewable energy. So, so, you know, in our view, the stuff that is mandated in a current laws and policies scenario gets built. Uh, once it's built, uh, the electric system is sort of dispatched on an economic paradigm. Uh, the renewables, like the nuclear plants, sort of run when they're available. And so it is gas and coal, and, and coal typically would run ahead of gas. Although, again, uh, one of the examples that came up about the, about the shale gas and gas production in that in 2009, say, with the uh, dramatic fall off in uh, gas demand, particularly industrial gas demand, you had very low gas prices. And in some regions of the country, you had gas running ahead of coal. But generally, we get the result that that gas over time uh, gets, gets a little bit pushed out uh, you know, by uh, by cheaper, by easier to dispatch technologies. In a climate change scenario, a lot depends on the nuclear and coal with CCS. In a world where you can't build those, there you see an awful lot of gas and renewables. Since uh, Andy mentioned the uh, Kerry Lieberman EPA analysis, just say a little bit about where you are in uh, EIA's. Uh, response to the Senator Kerry's request for your analysis? Well, <laughs> you know, we had been talking with them uh, quite early in the process and said, uh, we, we, we can tell you when you do it, when you tell us uh, what you want us to do. Uh, we received the uh, request for modeling in, in late April, and we estimated that we could provide an initial response in, in six to eight weeks' time. And on, on that schedule, we're looking at a sort of a mid-June to late-June uh, response, something we're working on uh, quite hard at the present time. Thank you. I think there's uh, one far in the back. Oh, hi, Brian Kennedy. I'm with the Government of Northwest Territories in Canada. You mentioned the domestic demand might be so-so going in, according to your model, in the years ahead. I'm, I'm just wondering, and you're suggesting that that demand may be probably met by deposits of shale gas. I'm just wondering where that puts pipeline projects such as the Alaska Pipeline Project and the Mackenzie Valley Gas Pipeline Project, which are both in the works. But I'm wondering now, in your minds, will they be pushed back significantly because of the deposits of shale gas and the so-so demand that you projected over the years? Uh, test my memory of the annual energy outlook. I think that the Alaska pipeline uh, we have in our reference case coming on in about 2023. So it's pushed back a little bit. But interestingly, when we look at these sensitivity cases with respect to shale, uh, you know, if we do this thought experiment and said if you didn't have any shale, uh, we would expect the Alaska pipeline to come on earlier in about 2020. And I think when we looked at the case where we had a lot more shale resource, uh, the Alaska gas pipeline did not come on to, until 2030. So you're, uh, because of the impact on, on prices. So the shale gas resource and our ability to use it has an impact on natural gas prices in North America, and that has an impact on the viability of these pipelines. So I think your, your intuition, you know, is, is correct that, that uh, shale as an alternative to uh, the pipelines transporting distant conventional gas uh, to the demand areas, uh, you know, is a significant factor. Okay, well, if uh, there are no further questions, that uh, just leaves me to, uh, Jim, do you have one final one? Mm -hmm. here, here. Uh, would you stack that up against the projected reduction of greenhouse 
gas emissions of 83% out of the CO2 system. Policymakers have a lot of work to do. <laughs> With that, I. Uh, Please join me in uh, once again thanking Howard and the EIA team. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.